Great film, right? Really interesting. I knew very little about Ida Lupino. I don't think I've ever seen a movie, so I actually, one of the questions mm -hmm. at the end is like, where do we see these? Well, there are opportunities now um, because in particular, um, uh, Kino has put out a box set recently. Oh, really? Um, Paramount has done um, some yeah. digital preservation. And we could stream them on Criterion maybe? You can, yes. Um, MoMA has in its collection a number of the Lupino films, including Never Fear, which is the, the film that the museum preserved. And, Let me introduce um, you properly sure. first. Sorry, got excited there. Um, so this is Anne Mara. She is a curator, educator, and archivist, and she um, was at MoMA for um, 39 years and has spent a lot of effort and time learning about Ida Lupino, so who better to have a conversation with her? Um, okay, so I want to start a little bit, uh, some context around the world that Ida Lupino was working in. Um, so at that time, there was this motion picture code that was known by like as the Hayes Code, which basically said, um, you know, no sex, no nothing. And it really hampered women um, in, a, in particular. So um, it was kind of waning when she started directing, but how did, if it did, how did that affect Ida Lupino's work? Indeed, the code was waning um, by her uh, inception as a director in the late 40s. Um, let me give you a specific example. In the film, Not Wanted, um, there was a lot of question about how she would do the birth scene. That's the unwed mother one. Correct. And or now we say single mother. Single mother, right. <laughs> and so she had presented her proposal to the, the code office, and it was supposed to be very much two shot from the woman's point of view, the doctor's, the nurse point of view, and it was going to be much more realistic. The film historian who says it's a little bit like Aileen is correct. Um, she was turned down. She could not, they didn't even want her to film a birth scene mm. uh, because of the whole idea of the unwed mother and why should she have joy at childbirth? Right. Why should the medical community um, promote this moment for her. So what Lupino decided to do was to shoot it all from the mother's point of view, but make it as, as blurry and as difficult to really ascertain, and then leave that moment in question. Mm. Um, there's, no, there's no joy, there's no sadness. It's just sort of cold. Mm. And so she managed to do that a lot with not only the, the motion picture code, but with the patriarchy um, at the studios, she ultimately did what she wanted to do. Yeah, this mother stuff is weird. Mm -hmm. I, mean, um, I mean, that's the last image of the movie too, yes. which is also kind yes. of like, ugh. Um, that was really on the back, that was on her directing chair? Yes, was mother, yes. The it wasn't mother, her name? Mother of us all. I mean, you can, you can see this in many of the, the photos taken on set. You know, she didn't become a mother herself until late into her, her career. It's when um, she was married to Howard Duff. Okay. They had a daughter, Bridget. Um, Howard Duff from Dallas, Duh, that guy, the actor? Howard Duff, that was Patrick Duff. I, oh, Duffy. Okay. I know Howard Duff is, okay, is a 1950s actor. Okay. Um, but I think she was right. She, was, she, she had to find a way to get things done. Mm -hmm. And so many of the people in this film who I know quite well called her feminist. I mean, some people said proto-feminist. I like to say she was a pragmatist mm -hmm. because she just had to figure out how do I do this and how do I get the, the permission to do what I want, the money to do what I want, and the people around me to do what I want. So she had, so they started their own company, which allowed her to do this because she couldn't, no, no, the studios, even before she had a track record, 
would hire her. So that was the only way in was independence. Correct. I mean, she had been under contract to Paramount and Warner as Brothers an as an actor. Right. Yes. And she was very successful, particularly at Warner Brothers, but she always ran afoul of um, the studio because they would want her to do things and she would say no. They'd want to lend her out and she would say no. Mm -hmm. So they treated her like you would an errant child at school. You're on suspension. But they didn't realize that suspension was the best thing for her because she would stay on set or she would roam around the studios and she would watch what the men were doing right. and she learned. Right. And she learned how to set up shots and lighting and editing and um it was a, it was basically a classroom for her so she had no real female peers at that time who was like her girl gang did she have like uh, well, friends and in, in the um, industry support structure I mean, there were hmm that's a good question um not really yeah. i'm she she went to work um the, the gossip columns like to talk about a rivalry between Ida and Betty Davis all the time, which apparently didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, they said that at the studio at Warner Brothers, Betty Davis was the top actor and Ida was her number two, and that wasn't really the case. Um, Ida had actually lots of friends, though, in Hollywood. She was known to be a great entertainer mm -hmm. at her home and often had people over and she was quite popular. Um, I don't know if she had like a singular person, but um, she was well regarded. And I think, I think her peers may not have always understood her ambition, but I think they admired it. Yeah. It's interesting now because a lot of uh, female actors make a transition to directing mm -hmm. and it's- Look at Maggie Gyllenhaal right, all of a sudden. Exactly, it's not frowned upon in, mm -hmm. in, in that way, but there was, there was huge gap between mm -hmm. Ilopino making their transition to like say Barbara Streisand making yes. their transition. Um, and I just find that so interesting. Like why do you, like she did it, then she kind of went into television and then you lost, you got, she kind of got lost in the mm -hmm. television shuffle, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, why do you think that nobody else was able to direct like she was? Well, I think so much has to do with the um, Hollywood yeah. being such a business. And to turn over any of that largesse to a woman was not something the guys are willing to do. But I, also, I just want to say first, she was not a male basher. Right. She really did respect her male colleagues, and she understood that that was the construct. And she, but she was going to do what she needed to do anyway. So I want to say that. But um, so Hollywood is an industry. Industry that industry made a lot of money. But when she was at the end of the filmmakers in 1955, and then she goes into TV, the studio system is crumbling. Right. Um, and as we talked about a little bit earlier, it takes like 15, 20 years before you see another female director, Joan Micklin Silver, and then those who come after. And how, we also discussed this a little bit earlier, how the men of the 70s, Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, um, George Lucas, they're on the rise, but where are the women? I will tell you where the women are. For the young students in this room who are looking to work on someone's films, her name is Stephanie Rothman. She was a, um, she's still alive. She lives in California. She worked with Roger Corman. She made a number of exploitation films So did Gail Corman. Ann Hurd work for Corman? Yes. A lot of women worked right. for Corman. And her films are just being rediscovered and hmm. being preserved. They're at the Academy of Motion Pictures. Um, I had the great pleasure of um, introducing her to the Turner Classic Movies Film Festival a couple of years ago. Um, at a midnight screening of her film, The Nurses, people went crazy. They had never heard of her before. Right. So there were women there. But, but just nobody... No one tagged on nobody to them. Cared. And, you know, here's a woman who is the contemporary of Martin Scorsese. Right. 
you know, and and um, she's now barely a footnote. And Barbara Loden also. Barbara Loden. Who was she married to? Was it Peter One of Fonda? Guys. Was she no, married no, no, to him no. now? No, I, no, a director. A director? Um, It'll come to me at 3 o'clock Somebody Google in the that. <laughs> Barbara Loden, who she was married to. Well, anyway, so... Th One but of the big, were big there. directors. They were there. The women were there. They just... No one paid attention. And in the 70s, you had the rise of... The, in the 80s, the rise of the blockbuster film. And these women weren't making those movies. So, again, they were sort of passed by. Do you have a favorite Lupino movie? Yeah, it's the first one I saw, which is Never Fear. And um, what about that film that, that really um, sort of gripped me was the last scene in the movie where um, the protagonist is coming out of the Kaiser Cabot Institute and she walks outside and there's an unbelievable, brilliant light, white, white, white light on the street. And she's just about ready to walk by herself but doesn't know if she can. And she's, she looks down the street and being you know, very, very hilly and there's a bit of an incline and she's sort of holding back, not sure if I want to go outside or not. And she finally goes outside and she's, you see this scene of her just holding the building mm. with her hand and she goes into the light, but the light is really the energy for her. And I think that that scene is so smart because it, it just sums up what's happened in the last 90 minutes. Um, and that's the first film. Actually, the filmography is a little skewed in the film. Okay. Um, the first film. Who was she married to? Kazan. Kazan. She was. Barbara Loden. Hmm. Barbara Loden. L O D E N. L O D E N. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that's wow. that's when she made the My movie. My goodness. <laughs> Thank you. So, just to sort of clarify the filmography, um, Not Wanted, the unwed pregnancy film. Is first? Is first, but directed, the directorial credit goes to Elmer Clifton. Elmer Clifton was originally hired to direct the film. Mm -hmm. He got very sick within the first week. There's a wonderful still that you see in this where she's all bundled up with a beret, her sunglasses, and she's sitting in the director's chair. Behind her is a gentleman, older man, all bundled as well. That's Elmer Clifton. Okay. She directed the movie but gave him the screen credit. Hmm. Okay? But she had told Hedda, Hop Hedda Hopper before the film came out, I want you to see the first one I directed. But she doesn't take the screen credit. The first screen credit she takes is for Never Fear. Okay. And that's the rape. That is the illness film. Illness. Yeah. Oh, the polio one. The polio film. Got it. Okay. I'm confused. So is there... It's a short filmography, but it's a, a it's very power. important one. So, like, they're all so radical. Yeah. And I know she didn't call herself a feminist because nobody called themselves a feminist in the 50s um, in that way. So, like, um, I would say now when people revisit her, that word is mm -hmm. probably commonplace in how yes. they describe her. Absolutely. I mean, I've seen, of course, feminist, proto-feminist. What does that mean? Before there was an established concept of feminism, okay. she created these films, these characters, these circumstances in, in the, um, within the idea and the notion of what we think of feminism now. Right. So before. I mean, did she have problems? Sorry? Prototypes. Yeah. Proto yes. Did she have problems with the crew? Like, the, the, when I talk to women directors now, like, crew guys, like, they just don't respect them. And did she have any of those issues? You know, she, she doesn't, she didn't really talk about it. I think that, first of all, I don't think she was a complainer, number one. I think that, like she says, and when the, the narrator uses her words, that she felt, well, you can't really fight with your mom. <laughs> and then I think she also was on the set sort of like, it's okay, you know, chummy. Yeah. Um, but she had a job to do and, and just didn't get bogged down in the muck. She, um, 
you know, the, the, the photo you see of her with Howard Hughes, she knew that wasn't a very good alliance, right. but he owned the studio. Right. So. Yeah, she also said she couldn't lose it, which is uh, still today. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, men can blow up whenever they want, and mm -hmm. women cannot do that. No, and she was, she shot very quickly because they had no money. Mm -hmm. um, she surrounded herself by the crew members who I think she respected and felt they respected her. And they were all men. Her. Yes. And um, she brought in young actors who didn't walk around, hey, you know, this is, I'm so and so. Mm -hmm. um, they were very, I think, happy to have the job. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've never really been convinced that her films were financially successful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, one of the historians in here says, you know, and women went to see her films and, you know, they were grateful for it. I don't know. Is that the dude? Oh, yeah, Tony. I don't know him. Yeah. I know Julie and Allie very well. I don't know Tony. Didn't love him. Um, but um, her films were not widely distributed. Now you know why they went broke. Right. Um, so there was a select audience for seeing her films. Right. And I think uh, she's far more popular now, I think, than she was in her time. What are we missing? What else are we missing that the film couldn't cover that you want to make sure people know about her? Well, I just want to, you know, very much declare that she was a pragmatist. She, she had to get her work done. It was, it was um, something she was driven to do. I also want to make sure people understand that she wasn't a male basher. It was the time in which she worked. I mean, you saw all that footage. There are no women on no. those scenes. Um, also, she was adaptable and she understood her time. I mean, think about the films that she made about rape, unwanted pregnancy, illness, a woman trying to balance career, marriage, um, the idea of you know, bigamy. Um, the Hitchhiker for me is always the outlier and I think it's an absolutely brilliant film. Um, but she she was of her time, very, very much of her moment. And I think um, I think that's also why when, you know, when when she was acting in films, when she was you know fulfilling her role as an actor, um, she did so well in films that were contemporary mm -hmm. because she really did look like other people. You know, she she sounded like other people. Um, she always bristled at the idea of having beautiful faces and, and glamour on the screen. She wasn't but about that. she was that. gorgeous. She was stunningly beautiful. <laughs> but, you know, when you stacked her up against Rita Hayworth, there was a difference, although... Well. But Ida was an intensely beautiful woman. Yeah. And I love the, the grit. Well, do you know if she ever had any issues with, you know, not... people not knowing her contribution to filmography? You know, um, I never met her. I, I wish I had. I know someone who was her conservator. Mm. And I think by the time the conservatorship had started, um, she was in some sort of decline. Like the Britney Spears type conservatorship? Um, maybe not as, as crazy as okay. that, but certainly- I thought you mean like person oh, who no, was no, conserving no, her someone... like archives. Oh, no, well, this taking person, care of her this issues. This person kind of took care of her. Got it. If you read the book behind the camera, mm -hmm. the one that's referred to, the first chapter tells you how the conservator meets Ida Lupino. Okay. And she's in decline. Okay. And I think that there were certainly moments when she thought, well, what about me? Right. And what helped her stay in the consciousness of the viewers. And I know it was something I remembered as a kid. When you, I used to watch things like The Courtship of Eddie's Father and Gilligan's Island growing up. And I remember seeing the name directed by Ida Lupino. And I thought, what is an Ida Lupino? You know, it's right. like the name was so weird. And right. it was a woman's name. 
And I think that's what kept her in the consciousness of the audience huh. was the fact that she did so much TV and was so prolific in TV. And Allie says at one point that she may have directed more than 100 episodes or episodic TV series because she was known as the go-to director when a lot of the guy directors on Sunday night were so hung over and they couldn't go to work on Monday morning to direct Rawhide, they'd give Ida a call mm. and say, what are you doing tomorrow? Mm. Can you go to the set and do X, Y, and Z? Sure. So she'd do day one and then the guy would come back on day two? Or she would direct the, the whole the week or whatever it was. So she's not credited for an awful lot of work. And that's, that's another area of study that I understand is, is ongoing. Ooh, that's exciting. So um, before we get to questions of the audience, so what do you think her film place is in history? Her I think it's important. I think her place in film history is, is important and I think is becoming more and more solidified um, as the, the field of study of her films opens up. Um, certainly with them being more available, they were not available for a long time. Right. They were really stuck in um, copyright hell. Yeah. Um, I know, for example, I, I worked at MoMA for 39 years. I retired about a year and a half ago. One of the films that I was working on before I left was the film Outrage to get it photochemically preserved as opposed to digitally preserved. And the rights... What, what, what does that mean, photochemically uh, preserved? On film. Okay. Going from the negative and the master film 35 millimeter material to a protection negative to new 35 millimeter viewing copies. And then uh, you could digitize it. Yes. Got it. Um, so Warner Brothers held the original materials. Paramount held uh, some sort of international rights. Warner Brothers had some kind of domestic rights, but not in, uh, you know, not, uh, you couldn't show it in the Bahamas or Canada if you wanted to. So it was very, very Why do complicated. I they even care about rights for a movie that's like falling apart in there? Yeah, I know. So it was, it was a real uphill climb. And ultimately, Paramount did put their money where their mouth was and did the digital work. So it is available through Kino and Criterion. Cool. Does anyone have questions? Daphne, you go. Yeah, good question. Did she ever encourage other women to become directors? Not that I know of, and I don't know if she was really aware of who came before her, like Lois Weber and Frances Marion. I've researched that and I never really found um, if she was aware of them or if she reached out to other filmmakers, other women filmmakers. Not that I know of, but I do know that there were um, film archivists who reached out to her in the, um, the 1980s and uh, there was one in particular named Barbara Sherris from Chicago who kind of got the ball rolling. And thankfully, it was all before Ida passed away. When did she die? 1995, I think. Anybody else? Hi, thank you for being here today. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Ida Lupino was originally British. Um, so I didn't know if you could speak on how she's regarded like in the UK versus how she's regarded in the States, if there's any major difference. She was born, I think, in 1918 in London. Very good question. Very good question. Because the Lupino name had this long history of performance in Europe. Her father was Stanley Lupino, who was a, a vaudeville music hall performer. Her mother is Connie Emerald, who also was a performer. I think it was her uncle, not her great uncle, but his name was Lupino Lane, who was a very famous silent film physical comedian. Um, and when in England, um, I don't think she was really embraced as an actor in the UK, they sort of looked at her, at her family as being important and influential. When she came to Paramount, when she was a teenager, she was like 13, 14 or something, her mother, Connie, was actually the one who went to Paramount for the screen test. 
<laughs> but they saw Ida. Oh my gosh. It was the same role her mother was trying to audition for, which was for a young prostitute. My goodness. And so they hired Ida. And she was, she was barely a teenager. And she never took her husband's names either. No, no, she didn't. Um, her first husband, uh, she married very young. Is that Collier? No, his name is Lewis Hayward. Okay. I think he was British, and I think he was a soldier. Mm. Then she marries Collier Young. Um, I'm not sure if it was a love match. I mean, what do I know? But it certainly was for business, mm -hmm. because he was a Columbia Picture Studio executive. Okay. And then she marries Howard Duff. You saw the whole strange triangle, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it, she's actually pregnant with Howard's daughter before she divorced how uh call your young so that whole triangle gets even more complicated mm -hmm. so and i love this is a little side but she used to call howard duff howard duffel bag <laughs> because he would always be leaving so he to would go always to work? Sep no, se no separating from oh, her they, were... they didn't divorce i think for maybe 15 years okay so Ugh. but certainly you can find her films you can absolutely find yeah, them. yeah i'm gonna and even the Trouble with Angels is a real treat. That was a, she was a director for hire with Columbia Pictures on that one. And um, I love Rosalind Russell. And it's just, it's such a, a delightful movie. What year is that one? Like 65, I so think. So she did make a studio movie. Well, that was it. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Did, is she in the uh, Motion Picture Academy Museum? Her films? Or, uh, anything about her oh her films i mean or certainly written, i'm sure you know, like a display oh, oh in the museum yeah, yeah. or they, she they might forget be. about her no i th she might be like in the the kind of history of women um she should be i should actually reach out to a, a former gonna, colleague of mine who's a curator there that museum soon yeah. we'll see um any last questions The Perils of Pauline. Who was in that? Who, the, who was in it or who directed it? Who, uh, who was in it? The lead actress. Uh, it's, that's where you were first Sure. Uh, for it all did, are you asking me, did Ida see the movie? or? Uh, well, my main question, basically, did she feed it off it? Because uh, I, I heard you say something about the silent film. Oh. OK. What I, what I said um, was that there were two major female directors in the silent era, um, Lois Weber and Frances Marion. And um, I don't think she was really aware of their films. Um, you know, Hollywood was not a very retrospective place. Yeah. They were Plus just worried about no, today. No cell phones and um, Google. Right. And whether she was aware of them or she fed off of those films, I don't know. But certainly, you can probably go on the Library of Congress website and look up um, Perils of Pauline. And either it's going to be streaming online in Jersey, and then it just got too cold to work in the wintertime, so they went west. Yeah. OK, we got to uh, wrap this up. But thank you all so much. And we have um, other movies in person at 3 o'clock, and then Killy Big at 6. And then you can also, if you have a hybrid pass, you can watch online. Thank you very much.